In the recent series where we examined the expansion of planets and moons, I explored the moons of our outer solar system to look at signs of this expansion. During this study I came across a number of very strange coincidences that were not relevant to the discussion on expansion, but I think do warrant a further discussion here, both in connection with the formation process, transmutation, and also what we assume are the normal celestial mechanics. Let's start by simply running through some of these findings. The first, icy worlds. All of the major moons, so here I'm not including the ones that are not large enough to be spherical, are all icy, bar one, which is Io. And we're talking here across all of the outer solar system. They all have icy crusts with a water ice mantle. Some are presumed to have a more rocky core, even Pluto is considered an icy world with mountains made of ice. Yet, when we examine the inner solar system, there is a marked difference. Earth still contains water, Mars is thought to have lost it, and there is speculation about whether Venus ever had one or not. When we examine the composition of the gas giants, we see that they are not all similar. Neptune and Uranus do indeed possess a mantle made of ice, but Saturn and Jupiter do not. So why do we see the same types of icy moons around all of them? Water is thought to be a very scarce commodity in the universe, but it would appear that it is everywhere. But how did it get there? In a simple accretion model, surely we should see marked differences across these moons similar to their parent planet. The size variation of the moons. The moons of Jupiter are significantly larger compared to the other moons in the outer solar system. If we examine each system, we can see that the radius steadily increases. Again here, Io is an outlier. And it reaches a maximum and then falls off again. Saturn and Uranus have the smallest average moon sizes. Titan appears as a real outlier in Saturn's system compared to the other moons. Neptune's Triton also appears excessively large in comparison to the average of Saturn and Uranus's moons. In the Electric Universe model, these moons would have been created by the gas giants during an electrical stressing event. There are many questions around how this process might work, but is there a connection between the size of the event and the size of the ejection? Is the fact that some planets have more moons an indication of more stressing events occurring in a short period of time? Do the moons arrange themselves into specific orbits? Is there a reason that the radius in general slowly increases to a maximum and then decreases? Are some moons ejected completely from a system? If we examine Titan, then it is a valid question to ask if it originated elsewhere and was then captured. Or was it created in a much more violent stressing event? Synchronous rotation. We know that the moon has a synchronous rotation or is tidally locked. This means that as it orbits the planet, one face will always point towards the planet. Now what I found quite surprising was that all of the icy moons on all of the outer planets all have a synchronous orbit. Now I'll let that sink in for a moment. Not one of those moons does not present the same face to the planet as it rotates. Why would all the moons end up being tidally locked? Tesla once wrote an article showing that the moon cannot be rotating on its axis. Instead, you can consider it like a record. Place an object at the edge, and it will orbit about the center, and present one face towards the center at all times. It never rotates about its own axis, though. Why is this important? I think this comes back to the question of origin. How were they formed, and what drives their motion? It is believed that the rotational motion of the moons and planets comes from the formation process. In the accretion model, as the gas and dust slowly fall in, they impart a spin as they fall inwards, which is then inherited by the object itself. And obviously as the matter falls in, the spin will start to increase. Spin can also be introduced by collisions with large enough objects. We can clearly see that there are large crater marks on many of the moons, yet none appear to be asynchronous in their rotation. Now you could argue that, given enough time, any system will lock itself into a synchronous rotation. 
But it would also be fair to say that this would not be the same for each moon, especially if we consider that they did not all form at once. Is it really possible that each of these systems has had enough time pass for that to happen, for them all to become tidally locked? Now, if the moons were not created by an accretion process, but instead by an injection process, would this process simply place the material at a specific location, like, for example, our record? Now, would an electromotive force cause the objects to move around the planet, like our record, and therefore not require a spin? That does then beg the question, why do some planets have a spin? So, again, this comes back to the question of, of is part of the process by which these objects are ejected out of this system, does that impart extra rotational energy which they then gain, or is it to do with the environment that they sit in? Now, returning to the question of why we see so much water in the outer solar system, I would like to investigate if the link here relates to the formation process itself. If we examine the major constituents, then it is easy to see that we have plenty of hydrogen, but we are clearly lacking oxygen to create the water. The solar system wind contains trace amounts of oxygen, but this really wouldn't be enough to create all this water. Assuming that the moons were created in an electrical stressing event, with large currents flowing inside the planet, which would cause jets to eject material, then is it possible that the oxygen was created in these events through some sort of transmutation and ejected along with the hydrogen and then reacting forming water in this ejected material? Or was it formed in a secondary step? Now I feel that these are important questions to ask relating to the formation of not just the moons in our solar system, but leading to the question of how the whole solar system might have ended up the way that it is. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.